Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Brian K. Vaughn is the man of the hour today, Jimmy. You know the comic shops were happy when they heard that <laughs> that saga was coming back out. <laughs> then outsells, I was going to say the X-Men, but that ain't even impressive anymore. Lay out some of that bibliography. Man, it's hard to know where to even start. Why the Last Man? Huge. Um, saga, of course, as you already mentioned, Ed. Private Eye, which I'm excited to dive into some of the distro behind that one. Um, Barrier, Paper Girls, and uh, some TV credits that people might be familiar with, such as Lost and Under the Dome. You know what, man, Brian, thanks for coming by. And the, 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 the first question of the day, uh, it's actually not a question, man. Why don't you let people know why comics are cooler than Hollywood? Boy, that's, uh, that's a good start. Uh, I mean, look, they're, they're, I love any medium of visual storytelling. So film and television are fantastic, but Hollywood is show business and the business is always first. And comics business is like a distant third, fourth or fifth when you're thinking about a project. It's just uh, creators and their idiosyncratic vision, no focus groups, no rewrites. It's just pure art from the artist to the audience and film and television it's just so hard for it to be that because it's so, so expensive. Um, so I, I like it, but I think it's way harder to do something great in film and television than it is in comics. There were a couple of times, like, uh, they, Hollywood gets a lot of tax credits coming to Pittsburgh to, to shoot stuff, and I would sure. sneak, sneak onto a bunch of sets and get that, like, Sopranos no-show job from my friends who run the, the extra casting, where they're like, yo, when I, when I was, like, young and broke, yo, put your name on this paper, come by later tonight, sign out, you get a paycheck kind of thing. But every now and then I would stick around and actually be an extra and see how that shit was made. Baffled that anything can be cobbled together with that gobbledygook, man, because it just looked like a bunch of nonsense. Ed, can we see you in the background of anything? Do you remember that uh, anything you made it into? Uh, you know, it's all fuzzy and shit like that. They, they put the nerdy dudes, you know, they fuzz them out with that depth of field so that they just focus on uh, Nick Nolte. <laughs> I want to see you in the back of uh, one, one of these crowd scenes the warrior with your like head this. down drawing, with your head down drawing while everyone else is cheering. I, I, would, I would bring, uh, this is the WYSIWYG era, man. So like, you know how you're just sitting around for most of the day when uh, they would be like, yo, cut, check the gates. You know that it's at least an hour before they shoot the next scene, pull up my ink and stuff, just ink for about an hour, put it away, do my little bit. That's like good. That's how you start being a professional cartoonist. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. you're drawing comics and getting paid. <laughs> but but <laughs> I'm a little off the uh, beaten track here. Brian, you, no, went no. To, you, you went to film school, correct? Yep, I was an NYU film school nerd. I think that you and I are about the same age. I think you might be a year or two older than me. So I'm, I'm very interested in sort of your comics background. But since we are talking movies and things... Wait, hold on. Is that true? I look like I could be your grandfather. You think we're both the... the... <laughs> The same age is wild. I, I was born in 77. I'm 76, so there you go. Yes. And you're both some old motherfuckers. <laughs> so we could, we, we, we could be talking about the comics we were buying in uh, middle school and high school, and, and I do sure want to get will. into we that. Um, but did you get away from comics? Like, whenever you decide to go to film school, are you still interested in comics? Like, what leads you in that direction? No, I, I never took a break from comics. From the first time I started going into a shop, I never missed a week from when I was whatever, you know, 10 till now. So it feels like a, a lot of people I know sort of drifted away as soon as they discovered the opposite sex or uh, something else. And I was just a nerd who I just, I, I never gave up on it. And I, I loved comics. I, I thought it would be great to write comics, but when I went away to college in 1994, there was no one offering such a thing. You know, you couldn't go learn how to be a comic book writer. So I thought film was sort of, uh, you know, adjacent to this world, and uh, and I liked it. So, yeah, I went to film school, but comics were still the number one passion the whole time I was there. That had to be a, uh, a great time to go to film school. You know, like like 90s indie films, you know, it feels right, like yeah. uh, being in, in film school in the 90s would have been, is there a better time to be in film school? Had Bob oh, and Harvey. Is there ever roots? a good time to be in <laughs> film school? It is an extraordinarily expensive endeavor. And I did, I loved all the movies that were being made then, but it did feel like every short film is a failed science experiment, that you have this vision in your head and it never turned out the way you wanted to. And still like the sound of expensive film 
running through a camera still i just picture like a uh, hundred dollar bills on a toilet paper roll just like spinning into oblivion it's so expensive to make a movie so i, I was frustrated i guess from the time i got there i was like man I i'm so bad at this it's hard and it costs a lot of money i wish i could just make comics how, how often did you ever get roped into a friend uh, who just graduated some <laughs> film program and they show you their experimental student film it's almost as bad as like the amateur stand-up comedian where you just want to like yeah they're dragging you along to their open, open mic nights Oof. best categorized in and best showcased in a uh, ghost world with the uh, teacher like mirror mother mirror remember that <laughs> shit dude i, I do <laughs> <laughs> brian do you remember if you were still into comics like throughout the 90s were you conscious of like, oh man, they're they're collapsing, like the industry is going south? Yeah, for sure. And I, you know, I, I started working at Marvel pretty early in 1996, so I was like, I got to be there to watch. I remember getting invited to the Marvel Christmas party. I guess like in 1997, it was like a huge open bar, big affair, and like that was it. That was the last time anyone was seeing that. So yeah, I, but it, it felt like the whole time up till today, it always feels like, oh, it's comics on the precipice of destruction. And it's never the case. It's always evolving and changing from what we grew up on. But yeah, I, you know, I, I had a sense things were troubled. And I also had a sense this is a good time to try and sneak in then if the things are falling apart. What was the stuff that kept your interest up in those middle 90s before you became a pro? Yeah, I mean, before, you know, it was like discovering Watchmen at age 12 is that's the mind blower. That's where I realized like, oh, there are human beings behind this and I, I want to be a part of it. So I just started following Alan Moore. And I remember before I left for college, a friend gave me uh, a couple of those, I guess it was Taboo that had From Hell in it. And I was like, oh, this is great. I I'm just going to keep following Alan Moore. And I remember when I got to college, I went to Forbidden Planet and they had a, a small killing, which is this uh, Alan Moore book with Oscar Zorate, I think his name is. And it, it just, I couldn't believe it. It was so excellent, but it was just this slice of life drama with sort of no genre element. So I, I think the 90s were just really just deepening my Alan Moore obsession and just like following him wherever he went and seeing where that took me. But at the same time, I was also reading, you know, a lot of uh, image garbage or whatever weird shit was coming out from Marvel. I was always like a, a Catholic, a small C Catholic collector that I, I liked it all. I liked Fantagraphics. I liked Dark Horse. I liked, you know, weird self-published shit. Just whatever was coming out. I liked it. You, you grew up in the Cleveland area? Yeah, uh-huh. Clevelander. Were you aware of things like American Splendor? Was there a good comic scene where you were growing up? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I was I was not super aware of American Splendor, but actually I was a sort of a cub reporter starting in high school for this uh, magazine that no longer exists called Northern Ohio Live Magazine. And Harvey Pegar actually worked at the magazine doing like jazz reviews and stuff. And I remember they once did a, a comics uh, issue that had like Bendis and Durf on the cover. And it was just like Harvey Picar was working at the magazine and they didn't even interview him for this. So Harvey was always kind of like a, a prophet in your hometown, like just not appreciated, I think, uh, in his lifetime. There are a couple of those artists like Gary Dumb and Joe Zabel. Do, do those names ring a bell? Did you ever have interactions with, with some of those, those local artists? Never had interactions, but, you know, certainly know of them. And you know, Azarello, I know, is originally from Cleveland and Bendis, obviously. And, you know. My wife is Canadian, so we argue about whether Superman is Canadian or a Clevelander. That I grew up learning of Siegel and Schuster, nice Cleveland boys, and she grew up in Canada learning, oh no, this is our pride and joy. This is a, a Superman is a Canadian creation. So we fight about that. But yeah, it's wild how many artists came out of Cleveland. You know, like our crumbs, sort of not from Cleveland, but like had a big sort of working at American Greetings and sort of like the pivot point of his career came in Cleveland. So yeah, that's true. I have no idea what the secret sauce is or what they put in the, the water. I feel like Ohio at large is a really important comics and cartooning state, you know, with um, Columbus. With, with, yeah. I mean, well, I'm thinking Kniff, you know, like you have Kniff coming out of Ohio as like, I don't know, gen a couple generations that really followed him as, as a big influence. Do you ever go to the Billy Ireland library? 
You know, I have not, but I think next time I'm home, my parents still live in the west side of Cleveland. So next time I go back, I'm finally going to go check it out. You know, that's only two hours from Pittsburgh, man. You got to stop by the compound to get you in front of the hot lights for real, man. Maybe maybe put Do some it. comics down uh, under the microscope and Anytime dig into it. That'd be fly as hell. I, I would highly recommend the Billy Ireland. That was one we used to do small press shows in Columbus. And that would always be like on the list of like, hey, if you're in town a day early, go to this. I did shows there for 10 years before I actually went to the museum. And then it was like every chance I got, I, I would go yeah. back. Um, it's phenomenal. And now it's yeah. even better in a new in a new giant state-of-the-art facility. But definitely in my mind, that's one of those comic things. Like if you're a comics fan, like put it on your list of things to do. So after, uh, you know, once, once you decide you're going to film school, do you feel like that's good training for comics? Like I often think a good story works in virtually any medium. Do you feel like you take a lot from your film school? And apply it to your comics? I suppose a, a, a little bit, but you know, like I, I remember reading early on, like people would interview Frank Miller about do you follow the 180 degree rule? And he would talk about how he violates it all the time and that the language of film is so different from comics that I don't think it applies very directly. I think it's more just any place that's going to force you to sit down and write or create anything, whatever it is, is going to make you better at anything else. So, I think that helped just forcing me to write more. Brian, you have these, uh, should we call them limited series, even though, you know, there are many dozens of issues uh, in order to, to tell these tales. But there's a beginning, middle and end uh, that you have in mind for these things. Uh, can you sort of lay out the process of something like that? Uh, is is it, I'm imagining macro to micro, maybe a sentence per what will be in each issue, and then you just zoom in closer? Lay some of that out for us. Yeah, I mean, it's changed over the years. Like with Why the Last Man, I pitched it as this five-year thing just because I was broke and I wanted a steady gig. And uh, But I didn't think there was any chance it was going to last, you know, more than six issues. So I had sort of a wild fantasy about where the story might go. But since I've been fortunate enough, I guess, to have a little more success now when I go into a series, it's definitely, yeah, let's, uh, let's plan it all out. And, you know, Saga is going to be 108 issues and I know what the last panel of the last page is going to be so sometimes it'll start with you know I know how it's going to open and usually I know how I want it to end and then you know there's this big uh, amorphous blob in the middle and uh, you know it just becomes finding those signposts that's like all right I know where I want to end and I know where I want to start so we have this roadmap to get here and let's just pick a few spots along the way and like with Saga, I'll know oh, this is when we'll be introducing a major character. Here's a major character death. But it's also why well, I try to be very locked in about the open and the close uh, to allow a lot of freedom for us in the middle, because that's always where the best stuff happens. The, you know, it'll always be, uh, you know, my collaborator at some point will mention, I've got this great idea and will take us off on a wild tangent that I hadn't been planning for. But since I know where I'm going after that, you know, it's sort of easy to connect the tracks. But I don't know. It sounds like a lot of rambling for what's really at this point just intuitive. I, I don't really know how it's done. And I don't have like a big serial killer board, you know, with like all like this is a texture. It's just it's all in my head. And uh, it's like I, I've learned a long time ago, just keep it in your head and the ideas that are bad will just slip through the drain. But there is sort of like a, a filter that's there to catch the good stuff and the good stuff will survive. So it's all up here. 108 issues. That, that sounds premeditated, like uh, not 110, not 105. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, it, it was based on I knew I wanted to do six issue arcs. And uh, I guess without spoiling anything, it was more about sort of there being 18 collections than 108. But yeah, it, it worked out to be 108, and that sounds good to me. So when you have these six issue arcs, you know, like a lot of criticism, certainly even on our channel, when we crack, crack uh, comics open, talk about that decompressed storytelling, uh, there's not often enough. Uh, substance in an issue uh, a lot of times man like do you have ways of mitigating that like uh, what, what's what's your process to try to give give the readers a little something every piece of the serialization I, yeah I remember hearing Bendis uh, talk uh, someone was criticizing like your comics uh, 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 they're they're too short and Bendis was like you're just reading them too quickly 
That is, uh, I thought that was such like a bold statement that this is on you as a, an audience to like, uh, it's how much you're gonna put into this. You're sort of the final collaborator. So I don't worry too much about like getting your, your dollars worth out of it. But I have found, I, I guess, you know, there's sort of a rigid haiku to Saga where it's usually one to five scenes and those uh, scenes, you know, are uh, each page is one to five panels. And that just always feels like a, a, about right to me for an ongoing series that five scenes usually gives you like an A storyline, a B storyline and a C storyline. And I think even if you're not writing a lot of dialogue, it, an audience feels like oh, the ball's being pressed forward, uh, is being pushed forward in this. So, um, but but I, I don't know. Uh, it's I'm sure there are plenty of people who are like, this is worth, you know, two ninety nine. This is a ripoff. But I don't hear a lot of that because you get 22 pages of Fiona Staples art. And it feels like most of my job is just staying out of her way. So my scripts always start really long. And then the process is just editing, just paring away. Like, why tell this in nine panels when I can tell it in four? And why have five lines of dialogue, you know, in this panel when I can do it in two? And it's just cutting it to the bone. I remember reading uh, Stephen King's On Writing. His process grew to be a stage, and I think he's kept it where it's uh, two drafts and a polish. I mean, it's a lot of drafts because I'll write when I first start writing, I'll just have sort of a, a shape of what I know it's going to look like. But writing panel description is extraordinarily boring. It's a chore. I hate it. So I'll just start with just placeholder dialogue. I'll just write the dialogue and that's sort of the first pass. So it'll be just 22 pages of dialogue. And then I'll go back in and start shaping that into panels. And as I'm doing that, I'm rewriting the dialogue again. And then it's going back and now writing finally the panel descriptions for what's been in my head. I just have to do the the grunt heavy lifting of writing it. As I'm doing that, it's like a third pass in the dialogue. And then when that's done, it's, yeah, I just remember Thing like Jim Lee, I guess a lot of artists do this. They hold their art up to the light or hold it backwards. And it's like doing that, the, uh, the imperfections sort of make themselves more known. And that's always my last weird step is going through and reading the script backwards, just out of order, where like lines of dialogue will pop out as then, oh, that's particularly clunky in a way that I didn't notice when I'm just burning through reading the whole thing. So. Yeah. And then I, I read it out loud. I have to wait till my family is gone because it's totally mortifying to read dialogue out loud and like sound effects. But that's also that's the very last step is force myself to read this stuff. It's not meant to be read out loud, but just do it. And as like a final check to see, you know, where is that one shitty line that I can just tweak a little bit more. So it's several drafts, but they're happening fast. You know, do you work with an editor anywhere in your process? Nope. No, just me. I like editors and I'm grateful to have, you know, had some great ones. You know, Heidi McDonald and Will Dennis uh, over Vertigo and Diana Schutz, a legend, uh, Dark Horse. And they're great, but I've just found, uh, like, I'm already sort of a grammar nerd and a stickler for that. So my, my scripts are pretty clean. And it's also, I, I just, you know, I think editors can make your stories better but I'm not interested in better stories. I just want the most personal thing that's come out of my head uh, as unfiltered as possible, you know, then seen through the eyes of an artist, that collaboration I want to protect, but um, I don't really feel like I need an editor. And early in the, the days I would send all of my scripts to sort of a brain trust of my wife as a playwright. I would force her to read it, my brother, uh, who I love and a couple other writers. But then after you do that for months and months, I just feel guilty about making people read my writing. But also you come to internalize their notes. Like you know what they're gonna hate and I know what stuff my wife is gonna make fun of me for. So I think early in your career, it's great to have an editor and great to have a brain trust, but there has to come a day where like the training wheels are off and it's just gonna be us. Have you ever worked Marvel Method? Like you, you work with some amazing cartoonists and you do it in like sometimes very long, you know, like like big works. Um, do you ever have you ever done like a Marvel Method where you're providing more of a of a looser story for them to interpret? I don't think so. I'm a pretty full script junkie. Probably the closest 
uh, has come as working with Marcos Martin on our panel syndicate or stuff in the past, whereas Marcos is like, I, you don't need to tell me how many panels are on this page, right? Or boy, like, I'm going to figure this shit out. Like, you can give me the dialogue, but I, I might change where I'm going to button a page. And uh, he's really the, the only artist I work with who does that. And it drives me fucking insane uh, that he does it. But I love him. And the result is so good that we're just like a, a bickering old married couple at this point. So he's the one that I'll sort of be like, okay, I'm not going to try and be overly prescriptive here and tell you what needs to happen. I'll just be like, here's the dialogue. Here's what I'm thinking. But Marcos is always going to do what Marcos is going to do. I, I like the Marcos talk because it allows me to get a plug in. Marcus did a cover for uh, my upcoming Hulk Grand Design book, and it's fantastic, of course, as you would expect. It's um, incredible. I saw it. I'm so jealous. He's so good. But uh, I'm glad you're talking about him because I was interested not just in the comics, but also Panel Syndicate. And I'm yeah. under the impression, you know what, for, for our audience that may not have be familiar with it, can you explain sure. to us Panel Syndicate? Yeah. More, all of it. You can go to panelsyndicate.com right now. And uh, it's this site that we set up with original comics uh, owned and controlled by the creators. And you can pay whatever you want, including nothing, to download and own a file in perpetuity. It's yours forever. And uh, yeah, it started out with, it was just a, an outlet for Marcos and I to do our own stuff, but we've since opened it up to a lot of other incredible creators. And we've got Alex DeCampi and Jay Ferber and, uh, and many others up there now. How involved is that, like you guys setting that up? Is there, you know, I mean, it feels like this app or something that you develop. Yeah, is that it, true? It is. So uh, it was around the time, like I just started working on Saga and I was like, this is the happiest experience of my life. Like to get to do truly creator owned work that I felt I, there's just no interference. I love just the architecture of image was so helpful that I was like, I'll be happy being here forever. And Marcos was like, it's time for us to start our own company and it'll be a digital thing. And like Marcos, we're both dumb old men who don't understand technology at all. Like we barely check our email. Like this is a terrible idea. And uh, he was like, I also want to do this, pay what you want where we'll put it up and if people want to pay nothing, they can. And I was like, that is also a terrible idea. And he's like, well, remember Radiohead did it? And I was like, yeah, they did it with one album and then never did it again. That's probably telling that this is a, a terrible business model. But he was really dedicated to this idea that, look, comics when we were growing up were a very inexpensive medium for everyone. And comics have become an incredibly expensive hobby for a sort of niche well-off, you know, us's to enjoy. And he's like, we can probably take digital comics and bring it back to that old model. Um, so yeah, we started with this book, uh, Private Eye, and uh, we put out the first issue and right away it was like, oh man, it, it really clicked. It We did so well that we were like, we're making more money than our old Marvel DC page rate to just do this, that uh, this is fantastic. And uh, I, I think truthfully, like we hit at the right time. There was a real sort of digital explosion that I think has waned a little bit as people are like, all right, I'm sick of my Kindle or iPad. I look at screens all day for my job. I just want a physical thing, but it hasn't disappeared completely. There's still a huge digital audience. And uh, yeah, so Panel Syndicate is there and maddeningly, uh, Marcos is doing a book now with my uh, longtime nemesis, Ed Brubaker, and it kills me because it's the best work Marcos has ever done. And I hate how much I enjoy that book. But yeah, Ed and Marcos are doing Friday now. Everyone should check it out. Brian, Brian could you, uh, because you brought up the idea of doing truly creator own projects uh, for Image with, with Saga and some of your, your other stuff, uh, can you sort of explain how that differs from you know, the copyright Brian K. Vaughn stuff that we would see from like Why the Last Man and, and like the way Vertigo works. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, I don't want to complain about anything because uh, Vertigo changed my life. And uh, I'm so enormously grateful for my time there. But yeah, it was sort of, um, uh, yes, clear that, that the term creator owned means different things to different companies. And uh, I guess for me, what creator owned finally 
ultimately means is like when Stephen King or any novelist does a book for a publisher, you know, they get the publishing rights and that's it. There's nothing else involved. There's no film, television, stage plays. That's always maintained with the author. It feels like comics is sort of carefully, like they realized early on uh, that uh, this stuff is hugely valuable. So I think there's some places, you know, that'll take 50% of the movie rights or, you know, whatever it is. It feels like that's not really creator owned. You know, it could be called creator participation, whatever you want to call it. But I think anytime you're working for, you know, Warner Brothers, which it was working at DC, it's never going to be truly creator owned. It's definitely, it's great. And uh, Pia Guerra and I you know, have benefited so much from it, but it's different from an image deal. See, rising tide raises all ships, Jimmy, and cartoonist Kayfabe, the YouTube channel, is brought to you by the comic books that we make. Uh, we each have a bunch of stuff that's in print, so let's give it a quick run through. And Kayfabers, if you dig the channel, you dig our comics, Kayfabe affect these comics, let these publishers know. That cartoonist kayfabe is a force to be reckoned with, man. Uh, to begin with, my earliest graphic novel, WYSIWYG, Portrait of a Serial Hacker, follows the history of high technology from the phone system to WikiLeaks through the vessel of a single computer hacker, 288 pages. Back to print is the box sets and uh, new printings of each volume of Hip Hop Family Tree, which is my linear uh, sort of retelling of the history of hip hop and rap music. Four volumes in that set. I drew this stuff from 2013 to about 2015. After that comes X-Men Grand Design, where I take the history of X-Men, probably 8,000 pages of material, uh, mostly by Chris Claremont, miniseries, combine it all into one big uh, story, 240 pages of primetime X-Men comics. Get these volumes while they're still in print. There's an omnibus as well. The stuff that I've been putting my energy to lately is... Red Room Comics, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit, The Anti-Social Network. This trade paperback is on stands today, collects the 2021 issues of Red Room, and lots of extra material in the back. Coming up in March is Red Room Trigger Warnings, issue number one, going to be coming out on a monthly basis, every issue completely self-contained. This is the cover that's going to be on the racks in the stores. These are the variants to go along with these comics, including the Jim Rug, by way of Robert Crumb, Zap Comics Zero cover. I'm gonna go in reverse order, Ed, and start with Hulk Grand Design. This is my next book that's going to be available in comic shops everywhere starting in March, but you can pre-order it now. This is a retelling of the Hulk history, celebrating 60 years of the Incredible Hulk coming in March, and uh, 10,000 pages distilled down into two oversized issues, and these are some of the variant covers that will be available for Hulk Grand Design. Ed Piscor, Peach Momoko, Marcus Martin, and now, Jeff Darrow. Yes. So you can order any of these at your local comic shop. These are not retailer incentives, so just let the comic shop know which cover you want. Get all the covers if you want to. They won't cost anything extra. And uh, pick this up in March, but order it now. Next time you're at your comic shop, or call your comic shop. Let them know about Incredible Hulk Grand Design. You can also still get Street Angel, Deadly Scroll Live from Image Comics, a homeless ninja on a skateboard. This collects eight complete stories of the Deadliest Girl Alive and is available wherever books are sold. And The Plain Janes, my 500-page uh, homage to shoujo manga about a group of high school kind of outcasts who start doing public art around their community and get all kinds of trouble as a result of that. Uh, one of the first young adult graphic novels. This thing actually began in 2005 and was just completed in 2019. So you can still pick that up again, wherever books are sold. Now that we're done paying the bills, back to the video. You talk about uh, Marcos fleeing your company and, and heading over to your rival, Ed Brubaker. Um, I wonder, is that a matter of sort of the output that you're capable of? Do you have kind of a limit or, uh, you know, are you always working at full capacity? Yeah, I think I did it at the time. I know when we finished Barrier, it just felt like, okay, we've done a couple of these now, and I'm sort of plotting out the next several years of Saga, and I just felt like I didn't have something great for him. And I didn't want to just do a book with Marcos just to keep him busy. But then I was like, I, I don't have it yet. And I, I, you know, I, I hope to work with him for the rest of my life. Uh, and I'm eager to work with him again, but yeah, I didn't have something. So I was like, go, you know, 
uh, uh, sow your oats, find uh, another writer and do something great. And, uh, and he did. But now that it's been a couple of years, it's like, and particularly this coming year, I've really been like, I've been doing so much film and television stuff for the last couple of years. I even told my agents, I was like, please, no meetings or anything. I, I just want to do comics for the, the, you know, as long as I can afford to. I just, I miss it. And I'm sure after a year or two of just doing comics, I'll be like, oh, I miss other human beings or getting to work with musicians or cool stuff from film and TV. But for right now, I just, I'm jonesing to do more new comics. It's one of the things that I really admire with a lot of your books is they feel, you know, you use the word new, they feel like they're new. They're, they feel like there's something you could put in somebody's hands who is a new reader. Um, I think Panel Syndicate, in a way, feels like an expression of that. Um, just this, I don't know, like uh, desire maybe to share comics with, with more people. Do you, ha do you feel that way? Like, get this in front of, you know, share this with your boyfriend or girlfriend or wife or husband, you know, sp spread the word of comics. Do you feel like you, d you design your work in a way that is new reader friendly? It's, it's uh, definitely a goal. I just remember being a, a freshman at NYU and like, I loved comics, but I didn't really have any comics friends in high school. You know, we didn't have like some message board I could go to talk with. It was just this extremely private thing of mine. And then uh, I went to film school and I, I got the first issue of Preacher and I just left it out in the dorm and it spread like venereal disease throughout this class. Like everyone read it. And it was people who'd never read comics before and just have young women coming up and being like, I love this. Where can I get more of it? I was just, and I love that book so much. And I'm like, this is so great. I, I, you know, and it clearly didn't feel like it was a, a comic that was in any way pandering or trying to reach a weird audience. It is so specific and uh, fearless and weird. And the fact that it connected, I was like, ah, th this is so much more fun than trying to convince someone to read like this particular Spider-Man storyline, you know, like start here and it's so impenetrable. This preacher was just like, start right at the beginning and just get something new and get ready to have your mind blown by something you can't get out of any film or TV that's coming out right now. I give, uh, I give Steve Dillon a lot of credit for that book too, in that it's almost unassuming the art, you know, like, like you could, I don't know that it's easier to read than not to read, but it's so easy to actually read. A hundred percent. And it was like, I, when I saw Pia Guerra's first pages of Why the Last Man come over my old school fax machine, I started pumping my fist because like this does, she's obviously a very different artist from Steve Dillon, but I think they're both master actors first and foremost, that their character work is so good that even a lot of comic artists I love have sort of like three faces. There's like gritted teeth and like closed mouth. And like Steve Dillon is the master of matching a line of dialogue and having his character sell it. And Pia Guerra was the same way. And they were both like, they're not reinventing the wheel in terms of layouts. It's like if the only comic you've ever read is Peanuts, you know, and like your daily uh, comics or Bloom County, whatever, you will be able to slip right into that. So, yeah, that, uh, Dylan, you're 100 percent right. Deserves so much of the credit for that. Hey, Brian, uh, we had a friend of the show, Dave Cho, came by about a month ago, man, and he described the situation going to uh, Dave Mandel's man cave, checking out that original artwork. He sent me a bunch of photos from that night, stoked out, and I... I saw, I, saw, I saw the back of your head with that mask on, uh, checking some things out, man. Tell us about visiting that original art cave. What were some of the standouts? What was the vibe? It's well, well, first of all, going to this thing, I was like, oh, man, I get to meet David Show. This is uh, whenever I get to meet a big time celebrity, I'm like, just play it cool. Don't take any photos. This is Omerta. This is a secret thing that we're doing. And then like the day after I saw he's, you know, posting to Instagram here, a hundred <laughs> pictures of the back of my head or whatever. So I, I hope uh, Dave Mandel doesn't mind uh, him opening up about that. But yeah, it was uh, a crazy experience that Felix Liu is a, a friend of mine, is an incredible art rep for Cliff Chang and a lot of other amazing artists and uh, invited me out to this dinner. And told me that uh, uh, Daniel Warren Johnson was going to be there and uh, David Cho, but he didn't mention that David Mandel was coming along. And uh, if people don't know, David Mandel is an extraordinary Hollywood writer, done Veep, but 
it's probably best known in our circles, I would have to argue, has got to be the king of collectors, at least from what I've seen. And uh, yeah, we just went out to dinner and uh, he was, David Mandel was kind enough to invite us over to his, yeah, his sort of bat cave. And uh, I keep telling people, I think there's something called Stendhal syndrome, which is this old thing like in the 1800s where people would encounter a piece of like a painting that was so beautiful, so like impossible to comprehend that they would faint or have a medical episode. And that is how I felt in this dude's apartment. Like every wall, you just turn over and you're like, oh, there's the, it, it's the uh, graphic novel cover for Watchmen. It's there's a Calvin and Hobbes strip just right on the wall. There's a, you know, fucking Darth Vader's costume is uh, standing on the side. It is just so dense. There's so much goodness in there. It, it is kind of overwhelming. But yeah, it was a religious experience. And I just hope. Yeah, it should be a museum, and maybe it will be someday. But uh, if Dave Mandel ever reaches out to you and makes this offer, it is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, so go do it. Yeah, sounds good. He's going to come on the show at some point. We are talking about that sort of thing. You know, I was uh, I, I read somewhere a long time ago that uh, Charles Dickens would, uh, write, would begin his writing day after taking 20-mile walks. The idea sort of came and would flow and things like that. Uh, do you have that similar experience with um, cultivating your ideas? Don't force it. How does that work? Yeah, it's weird. I was just uh, uh, writing about this experience. But yeah, I've started with my uh, tiny, mentally ill dog milkshake. We take a seven mile walk every day. So that's how it starts. We go for two and a half hours and uh, I'm just the phantom stranger of the San Fernando Valley, where I'm just haunting the streets and just walking forever. And that is most of my job happens there. And like maybe that first hour, I'll talk on the phone with someone, or I like listening to dumb podcasts that just have people speaking extemporaneously, nothing written, but I just felt that sort of primes the dialogue pump. But then I need like just an hour and a half to just walk in nature uh, or, you know, as much nature as Los Angeles has. But yeah, it is, um, yeah, cultivating ideas is a good way to put it. And other people have described it like this, but it is not hunting. That anytime when I go out, I'm like, I need a great scene today, or I need a great idea, you never find anything. That it is more fishing, that you just put your net out in the water and uh, you just, you know, hope to catch something. And, uh, I've gotten pretty good or pretty lucky, I guess, at fishing. And to just have, it is such a privilege to have enough time in your day to just have that much walking and just keep your phone off and have people not bother you. But yeah, I, I don't know how to write without walking. And it seems like most of the writers I admire have a similar sort of walking addiction. With with that setup, do you at least carry a fountain pen and a small notebook or is that still keep it in the head kind of process? Yeah, same. Uh, Garth Ennis always says like a tiny... Uh, book that he carries with him everywhere and jot stuff down and I'm like maybe that's why he's a way better writer than I am and that I just forget all this stuff but no it is just keep it in my crowded head and I have a pretty good memory for it and yeah if I forget it it, it wasn't worth holding on to but it's all up here man as someone with a terrible memory anytime I hear someone say that I always cringe a little bit <laughs> I tend to write down everything um, right. maybe I should I am, I'm paranoid about yeah. You know, like I'll get hit by a bus and I at least want Saga to have a proper ending. So I remember I, I just told my wife one day, I was like, in case I get hit by a bus, here is the ending. And I don't want to write it down somewhere. So it's going to be hacked into or stolen. So you're the keeper <laughs> of this now. But uh, so I gave this all, and I was sort of quizzing her recently. And she like kind of remembered it. But I was like, no, this is this sacred document. She's like, I, I got it. It's fine. It's, uh, it's all good. That's funny. I remember when I was in college, uh, my graphic design teacher made us read this book on creativity and, you know, taking a walk. It's this repetitive behavior, washing dishes. Um, I forget who it was, talked about showering like six times a day. Everybody talks Aaron, about that Aaron Sorkin one. is, uh, he's one of those shower junkies. But it's, it's this whole idea of like that physical repetitive behavior puts your mind in a certain space. And the other thing that I've been coming across lately is like creating that space. You know, you talk about doing that walk every day, um, you know, sort of whatever the system is scheduling that time in, you know, even if it feels like at times it's not productive or you're not getting the results you want, creating that space and time 
to be like, this is it. This is where the muse needs to come, and maybe some days it doesn't, but I'm going to allow that space and time for it uh, regularly. For sure. It feels like you can train yourself in some ways to kind of make the brain work that way. You know, like, come alive, it's time. You, you see examples and you hear examples of guys who, like, work in, like, the rigid, like, say, four-panel comic strip format. Like, you, you start to think right. in, in four-panel moments. Yeah, like, you process. Life happens right. in four-panel beats and shit. Crazy. Yeah, I am a, a big backer of yes, just repetition and training is uh, it's the only reason I'm a working writer is it was just I had to force myself seven days a week, just write a little bit every day, even if it's just like a bad journal entry or just hacky jokes, just forcing your body. And like after you do that for a month or two, it feels weird if you have a, a skip day where you don't and it's yeah you just have to force your body because it is writing i find is terribly unpleasant it's not something i enjoy there's some people who are like i love writing i'm the old dorothy parker uh, i i hate writing but i love having written uh, i love the end result i'm proud of it i like thinking about it but the act is it's not hard it's not like digging ditches for a living or any like actual jobs that human beings have but it is mentally less pleasant than doing almost anything and like just the siren call of video games or anything is so strong that yeah i really have to force myself to be disciplined to do this because i'm not a natural writer at all you you mentioned sorkin and and he, and he talks about like the act of writing he talks very similarly and he even would bring up the idea of ditch digging and his whole thesis is like if you're a ditch digger you at least know what the job is and the goal and oh, yeah. the end result the writing thing, way more amorphous. Who knows what the heck? Are you on the right track? Are you not? And there's like mind games that you play with yourself the the, the entire way. He also says that uh, like second drafts are much more pleasant than actually putting down that the the first cornerstones. Oh yeah, it feels like in television, uh, like being in the writers' room, I found was a lot of fun, and then being on set makes me want to kill myself or it's like, it's extremely hard and you just see the limitations of the real world and everything sort of falls apart and it's it's difficult. And then the editing room is fun again, because you're like, all right, it, we don't have everything we need, but here's this mound of clay we can start sculpting. And second drafts with comics are like that, that anything is better than just this blank page that, yeah, it taunts you. I have so many directions I'm interested in going. <laughs> I don't think this is going to be a very linear conversation. Um, but I'm, I'm curious about the, uh, the return of Saga and your relationship with fans of that. Have you kind of felt this like psychic wave of, of positivity rolling over you as it has come back? As a B side to that also, the retailers must be hitting you up saying, thank you so freaking much, man. Some of the shops here, man, will sell two, 300 copies of that uh, whenever an, an issue comes out, man. So... What's the vibe? We, everyone has been so nice, which is great because they were so mean for the last <laughs> few years that it would just, I, I, I was, I, I keep saying I'm grateful for people's impatience because everyone was like, what's wrong with you? Just put in, uh, Image said there were retailers would send like pictures of retailers with their kids being like, my children are going hungry because <laughs> you're not putting out this book. Where, where, where is it? So yeah, I felt such shame and uh, like, I didn't want to go to any conventions or post anything publicly because everything is like, we don't care what you're working on or talking about, just where's Saga. So it is such a psychic relief that it's back and uh, it's out there and people have been so kind, retailers in particular. So yeah, I'm, I'm grateful. Very are, glad it's back. Are a couple issues in the can, like people can expect a, a little dose of them for a while? Oh yeah, yeah, I know. We made a, a point of you're going to get this six issue arc like we always do, you know, where it's six bang, 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 uh, and they're all coming out. And it's Fiona Staples just somehow completely leveled up over the last three years. Like it's wild. The, the, the first page of the first new issue is sort of a callback to the first page of, of the first issue. And, you know, Fiona was an extraordinary artist out of the gate, but to see how much she has evolved from early saga to now is wild. And then like you compare the quality of the writing, and I hope it's at least that it's just exactly the same, that I have just plateaued completely <laughs> and it's humbling to work with the collaborators. Like, oh no, I'm still pressing myself and learning new things. So I'm just, I'm 
endlessly in awe of her. I think she's one of the best artists alive in any medium. Have you, did you ever consider Saga as just being the, uh, the trade paperback releases, I, I guess a series of graphic novels as opposed to the comic books? No, no, because I, I mean, I love graphic novels, but they're very much their, their own thing. And I, I mean, I knew early on Image was really concerned when we were like, we were starting to put it out and we realized like, oh, Fiona is coloring and penciling. She's doing everything, you know, some of the lettering as well. And it's always 22 pages. None of these uh, cheapskate 20 page knockoffs that you get from Marvel or DC. We do a lot of stuff. And she just wasn't going to be able to do that 12 times a year. And it was also clear, there's no way I'm going to bring in a fill-in artist. It's like Fiona is that book. So we did this thing where we're like, all right, we also don't want to do like every other month. It feels like you lose momentum that way. So we came up with this idea of let's do six monthly issues and then we'll take a break. And Image was like, you know, we're Image. You can do whatever the hell you want, but it, it's probably going to tank the series. That retailers sort of make their orders based on, you know, how many books is sold last month. And when you're gone for a couple months, they're just like those orders drop down to zero. So, you know, we did think, do we start doing this? You know, should we do them as just graphic novels? But we came up with this kind of hybrid model of, Let's do six monthly issues, a break, put out the trade to let people catch up and then come back with monthlies. And it worked so well that we're like, this just combines everything that we love about serialized monthly storytelling with sort of the, the freedom of, you know, ongoing graphic novels, I guess. Do you have any sort of back end uh, promotional stuff like uh, some some writers have built pretty elaborate newsletters and mailing lists and stuff? Is there is there a blast that you put out to a bunch of people to uh, spread the word? No, no, I'm so bad at marketing and uh, and so lazy about that stuff. So now, you know, like we don't really have a digital presence. We have an old school, we have a P.O. box where people lick stamps and send letters to us. But I, I realized so I probably could have assembled like a, a hugely valuable mailing list out of all of these names and addresses. But I just throw the envelopes away after I get it. So, no, we do so little. But I also learned early on in comics and people would complain about sort of the lack of promotion or that promotion is, is does very little. That the only reason I've ever picked up a book is because I heard a lot of people saying it was good. And that's it. And so you just got to put out something that's good and noisy and makes people talk. So I've always thought my time is better spent writing the book than it is going out and pounding the pavement and selling it. At the same time, I'm here shilling my wares, talking to you guys. So I'm not completely against uh, going out to pimp your wares. But I was going to say, you can't do much better been promotion priority. than this, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's the best. You guys are the only game in town now. Everybody knows it. So uh, the kingmaker. T- tell us a P.O. Box story. What's What's been something shocking, great, uh, maybe terrible? Tell us something you've pulled out of that P.O. Box that you remember. Oh, man. I mean, yeah, people have sent us uh, invitations to their weddings, which we haven't done yet. But we usually send a gift off the registry if you invite us. Oh, boy, you're going to be getting hit up quite a bit right now. Here's the gamble, though. You might be getting a gift, but you also might be getting me. I might just show up and uh, I'll murder an open bar. (laughs) Now it just tripled. Now it just tripled the (laughs) amount of uh, mail that's coming in. Bring them on. Uh, But, you know, we get... uh, a shocking amount of prison correspondence and uh that's been really fun but it, it's also been kind of harrowing because they'll be like look can you help us get future chapters uh in and the prison library doesn't want to bring in this stuff because of content and so it, it's been i feel like i've been doing a deep dive into prison libraries and figuring out how to get more graphic novels into them so which i never would have gotten you know if we just had an old school email thing so yeah the letters they're great you know they have computers in prison. You might have, you might have gotten some some info. Maybe you're right, but there is something about the the fact that you got to put a stamp on it just really weeds out the cranks and the trolls who are. It is just such a self selecting group of uh, lovely human beings, and like I think people really like write and like they write longhand, and it is a nightmare to transcribe. Like it takes me as long to make these letter columns as it does to write uh, an issue these days. But 
it really is a community of people who like each other. And like, I like when they don't talk about the book, there's just dating advice or, you know, we've had marriage proposals on the back of the book and, uh, it's uh, it's a lot of fun. I just I said in this first issue, I was like, "Where did this is a creator own book, and creator own books don't have audiences; they have families, just small groups of people who love something enough to try to keep it alive." And it does. It is like an overused term, like the family of comics. But this saga readership, you know, I've been hearing from kids now who like started reading the book in high school, and like they have kids of their own now. It's nuts. Nuts. That's really cool, man. Putting use to, to the letters page, maybe one of the last great letters pages uh, to to exist in, in the comic book format at this point. Stealing a lot from Optic Nerve and the, that PO box, I feel like that was just always, and I love that. And the preacher letter column that were two that were like, this is as good as the material before it. So that's true, man. Yeah. Like when like all all of Garth Ennis's input and stuff, like you learn a lot of things in the the preacher. Yeah letter pages may learn about action and battle comics that are not action comics dc comics but the predecessor to 2000 ad that's yeah. where you learn about that stuff man so we were talking about uh you know graphic novels being different than comics and and e-newsletters and you do have something that fits this description right you're working on a new graphic novel that you're serializing on substack yep so i want to ask you about this because i i'm very interested in distribution and you know you've done interesting stuff with Panel Syndicate, and now it's like you know you're trying another distribution model with Substack. Yeah. Um, do you want to give us the uh, the lowdown on that and talk about yeah. you know your decision sure. to go that direction? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I'll work with anyone who does a, a few things that you have to give writers and artists true hundred percent ownership of all rights, and Substack does it to a fault where it's not just. And we don't want movie rights. We don't want TV rights. We'll also give you the publishing rights. If you want to take this stuff and go print it up, fine. Uh, so that's a big one. Uh, then no editorial constraints whatsoever that, you know, whatever we want to do, we get to do. And, you know, there aren't too many games in town where you can do that. An image and panel syndicate are two, and I love them both, and I'll work with them more. But it feels like panel syndicate is... I think the ideal place to do a mini series. The mini series are a real tough sell in uh, the direct market, where sort of you know how many first issues retailers are going to order, and they're going to sort of cut it in half by two. And by the time you get down to six, that's it. And if it's just meant to be self-contained, like we stand on guard, my mini series, there won't be a, a future second volume to sort of pick that first volume up. Mini series are tough, but Panel Syndicate feels like the perfect place to do that to just have a six, seven issue thing and you get to leave it up online forever. People can discover it whenever. So that's the place where I go for mini series. Image feels like for an ongoing series, this is the best place to go. That, you know, Saga, the first couple of issues I wrote for free, that was the trade off, was I, I said, Image, if you'd be willing to front money to the artist, I won't take any money until the book comes in and only if you make your money back, what you paid for the artist, et cetera, then I will. So, uh, but yeah, usually that's sort of, yeah, you take nothing up front, you gamble on yourself. But then I, I knew with Nico Henrichen, who he and I did Pride of Baghdad a million years ago, we wanted to do a graphic novel again. And it felt like doing a graphic novel, it's especially of the scope we wanted to do, where it'd be like over 300 pages that image isn't going to be able to front that kind of money to an artist to do it. And Panel Syndicate isn't really set up for this either. So it felt like Substack, let's roll the dice here, where there is a grant component that you know we can funnel towards the art, but there's also this crowdfunding element that if people like it, they can keep it going. And I knew that the end goal is to yeah, have a self-contained 300 plus page book but that, yeah, we could do something where instead of Panel Syndicate, where we put out one issue every two to three months, here we could put out a good chunk of pages every Monday and just read it a little bit at a time. And so, yeah, it, it is, it's very different from writing a graphic novel. It is more like Terry and the Pirates, where like you have very limited real estate and you just have like, every week people are gonna get, what, like nine to 12 panels. How can you give them something that feels like, oh, I emotionally got something out of this. I want to come back for more, but recognizing it's meant to be read in a larger piece. 
I don't know. It, it's new and I'm only a week into it. So we'll see if it blows up on the launch pad. But the response has been really good so far. And yeah, we're having a lot of fun. This yeah, we, we dropped the first 10 pages uh, the first week. And now this coming Monday, we do the next four pages. And, and there's something coming up uh, that not even particularly because it's graphic, but you'll know this page when you see it. And this page, I think, would have prevented us from being published by most major publishing houses, I think would have not touched us. So to just know like, oh, we get to do something that is, uh, yeah, it, it feels, uh, it's exciting and a little dangerous and weird and working without a net, but it's cool. That seems like a really smart, I, I, I hate to say it this way, but it's really smart to put an element like that in early on the run because it's something that I assume will start conversation or whatever passes for conversation online these days with something controversial. Um, it's, it's interesting to have that in there early in the, uh, early in the syndication. Brian, is there a URL to, to point people to? Yeah, uh, uh, as a matter of if you just uh, Google the term uh, exploding giraffe, that will take you uh, straight to us. So uh, the name of our Substack is, I think it's explodinggiraffe.substack.com or whatever it is. But in Pride of Baghdad, there's this scene with an exploding giraffe that has become a, a meme over the last decade. That just any time it pops up, this weird, lushly illustrated image of a giraffe's head exploding. People are like, what is this? Where did it come from? And to the point where if you just search the phrase exploding giraffe, our names come up. So we decided when it was time to start our sub stack, we'll just lean into it and call it exploding giraffe. And that will take you right to our site. And spectators is the name of our new graphic novel. Super cool. Do you manage that yourself? Like, are you physically putting together the, the I guess, the, the newsletter each week? Yeah. Yeah. And it felt like uh, being like back at my space, like I'm learning how to code again. Like, how do I turn something into a hyperlink? And uh, it was nice that, you know, and Substack is great. They're like, we can hook you up with an editor. We'll pay out of pocket for that, a designer. And I was like, I want to be able to do this quickly and uh, with as little interference as possible. Let's just see if it can be just Nico and I and Phonographics is the letterer of sagas joining us as well. It feels like the three of us will be able to figure out how to do this. So every Monday, you'll get new comics. And then every Friday and maybe more, you'll get some extra stuff from us as well. Makes me and, curious uh, if, you're, if, if your approach will evolve once you start playing with this and, and get a few months in. If you start thinking, you know, like we said, guys that do newspaper strips, they start to sort of like process things through that four panel experience and i wonder if you know the format itself or the platform will start to influence how you write it how nico creates the art for it you know any of these things yeah it is is this weird combination of like i i, I felt ready to do a graphic novel because i've been doing serialized comics for so long that you fall into like okay we know it's time for another BKV cliffhanger is going to come here. And it's like, all right, I'm going to take away all the sort of crutches that I'm known for and do something that doesn't have traditional cliffhangers, doesn't have these sort of bang, bang, bang scenes. But I could say Spectators, this graphic novel, opens up with a 35-page scene, which is the longest scene that I've ever written. And it does feel like sort of counterintuitive to put out a few pages at a time. And instead of like doing dense, you know, 12 panel pages where it's multiple scenes in a page, we are very leisurely laying out the scene. And yet, I think you're getting something from each of these three to four panel pages. I mean, one, because it's Nico drawing it. I think he's one of the most gifted draftsmen alive. And he's just been, I think, aching to do something like this after Pride of Baghdad. I think he sort of got pigeonholed as like, oh, he's the animal guy. So give him animal stuff. And I love just getting to see his characters like grounded in the real world human beings just looks so good so i'm biased but i love just getting a couple of his pages every week it feels like a great way to experience this what's the uh what's the sort of layout is it is it a scroll or is it click to the left or right for uh, it, the next page we're doing right? you can download however you want you can get like a, a cb whatever file or something but i'm just putting it directly into an email it's just like uh, just pages so you can just read straight down you can scroll through them on your phone and we're having just sort of big enough that you can read it on your phone if you want to i think it looks cool if you want to mirror it to your big screen tv and watch it there you can but 
I don't care how you read it. It's but you know the the end product is we are. I deliberately wanted to do a graphic novel that's ultimately going to be slightly different in shape than graphic novels. I wanted to be sort of closer to a traditional Stephen King, John Grisham, whatever hardcover. Because I realize I think a lot of people are sort of fetishists about size. Like there's so many people who will be like, oh, man, I love uh, Private Eye, but I just hate the way it looks on my bookshelf. It doesn't match nicely with everything else because it's a sort of widescreen book. And I'm like, who, who cares? It's so glorious. I like that it's different. But I do, it, it made me realize, I think there are probably some people who love to read and don't pick up graphic novels just because it's slightly closer in size to like a coloring book than a grown up sort of adult novel. So I, Nico and I, before we were even talking about Substack, I was like, I, I want to format these pages and format as a slightly smaller, slightly uh, thicker uh, novel. So that's our end goal. How you experience it digitally is just whatever floats your boat. Yeah, the only thing I was thinking about is like when you have the scroll where you're just going down, reading the pages that way, it opens up this opportunity for like more than one kind of punchline or cliffhanger moment or aha kind of experience than like when you see that on the actual page, you know, it's different than the reading experience of like that way. I never thought about that because especially... um I don't know, Brian, if you read things like uh, Webtoons or, or um, Tapas or any of those, you know, like phone formatted comics. Yeah. But yeah, like you really are getting that panel to panel. Like you could yeah. have cliffhangers on every single juxtaposition. Um, we have a friend, uh, Tom Shioli, and we were talking once about reading EC Comics, and he talked about how he would cover up the last page because uh -huh. he didn't want to reveal that twist, you know, when you open up a spread. And in a weird way, if you're doing it on a phone and it's scrolling, like you really protect all of that, yeah. whatever the next image is going to be. Definitely, that has been one of the joys about working with image is protecting your page turns. That I'm always like, yeah, you can have a big surprise going from the left-hand side to the right-hand, but you wanna save your huge surprises to be on that right, so you don't get it till you turn the, the page. And sometimes when you'd be at Marvel, I'd plan those page turns and then I drop, you know, a Snickers ad or something in and it totally ruins that. So I love a page turn surprise, but you're right. When you're reading down, it is a different kind of thing. So I'm, I'm learning about it, but I guess my, I've always, even before digital, it's always been every panel is a cliffhanger that should be pulling you you know, to the left and down to the next panel, that everything is a mini panel. End of a page is a slightly bigger cliffhanger. End of a scene is a bigger, end of an issue is the biggest cliffhanger. But it's always just that forward propulsion that makes comics feel immersive, where it feels like you slip into it. It's just all about that pulling you forward, the stories. But I always try and do that, no matter what medium it is. Great morsels. Thank you so much for that. And it makes me think about... Uh just the stuff that you read about the craft of writing like if you can take it out it doesn't belong you know keep that shit lean keep that shit tight i love it yeah, i feel like that really applies to comics you if you ever see like adaptations where it's like a short story but then it adapts to like 93 pages of comics it's uh yeah being lean and efficient uh very important in, <laughs> definitely in something I guess, working in television that helps seeing that like starting on lost and i'm like We've got this rigid format where it's going to be teaser plus four or five scenes. And just knowing that, yeah, we have commercial breaks that you have to have a good enough cliffhanger that people aren't going to flip away and watch this. That, yeah, that, that was definitely helpful. And I've talked about this a lot, but it, it, I guess it was more learning a language that this, that early on in the Lost Writers Room, they would talk about uh, schmuck bait where like I'd pitch a cliffhanger to something and they're like, Vaughn, that's schmuck bait. And schmuck bait is just a way of saying like, if you put a gun to one of the main characters' heads, only the schmucks in the audience are gonna think that guy's gonna get shot. Now that's like, that's not a good cliffhanger. It seems like one, but just putting your protagonist in danger is the weakest way to end something. That like ending on an emotional revelation is like, that's really hard. So. When people are like, oh, it's, you know, cliffhangers are kind of hacky or easy. They're really not. A good cliffhanger is so hard to write. It takes a lot of time. Watching Better Call Saul, like, they, they were talking about Vince Gilligan and crew. Like, one of the mandates was their version of schmuck bait uh, would be, like, you know, not, not ending on those sorts of things. So they will almost antagonize other writers with 
versions of that where there's a there's a massive there's a car accident that happens with the main character and it goes black like and you think it's going to commercial and then it just comes right back and she's got like a broken arm in a hospital <laughs> totally just fucking with other writers man who, who do All that right. sort of hacky shit brian what what do you look for in in your artist you know like like you talk about working with with nico again um you know i feel like the artists you work with are what i consider to be good artists but is, are there qualities that you look for in a comic book artist or that you think of a good comic book artist needs to have these Canadian turns out to be <laughs> super helpful. When I realized, like, it's Adrian Alfona on Runaways, Pia Guerra, Why the Last Man, Steve Scross, uh, uh, Nico Henderson was living in Canada when I started working with him. My wife is Canadian. So, you know, I used to joke about that, but part of me wonders is like this deep bench of Canadian talent did just like as our public schools, like the, the art was just getting chopped out mercilessly. Like, did they just have a better arts education growing up or is it because their, uh, you know, their social safety net with health benefits is better that they feel like, oh, we can take a chance on a gig that Americans wouldn't be uh, allowed to do. But I, I'm trying to solve why are there so many great Canadian artists and why do I get along working with them? But. I'll add one more possibility for your Canadian artist thing, and it's the northern location. Ah, uh, yes. Because, like, winters, you know, like, we have it here in Pittsburgh. I, I know uh, cartoonists in Chicago who talk about, like, once winter sets in, like, you don't really leave. Many generations like, You're just inside for, for months. Yeah. Um, so if you're Cleveland stuck inside... Is the same a lot of people... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think you might be onto something. So... Uh, it helps if you're Canadian, but um, I guess more than anything else, like I, I think about, you know, Cliff Chang's not Canadian, but he's, they're just all like such responsible, professional, down to earth people that I guess that's a big thing. It's like we're entering into a relationship and I feel like I'm kind of a, a mentally unstable weirdo and I just need to have like a rock to lash myself to. So uh, I like Yes, finding artists who are, are stable professionals, good people. And then, yeah, I think it's just about performance, too, because I just want good actors to elevate my dialogue, good actors on the page. And then, that, you know, after that, that, that's it. I just like hearing, you know, uh, the first thing I was asked is, what do you like to draw and what do you hate to draw? And just making adjustments from there. But I've been so fortunate in my career just get to work with amazing people very lucky let's go back to the comment of you being the unstable creative uh, partner in these relationships you've put out a lot of books without an editor that have come out on time for very long runs how unstable are you actually that that sounds like that's a fun thing to say but i mean uh, I, it is uh that is not a false humility or like you guys should do one of these with my wife and just talk about <laughs> what it's like to live with me and how it has gotten no better in all the years that I've been doing it. It is always the same that like I start with an issue. Uh, my wife calls it the uh, the roller coaster that I'm on because it's like the beginning of the week is like, OK, I, you know, I got a new issue. I know what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm feeling good. And then like my mental immediately starts to go down as I realize like, uh oh, this isn't working. I don't have enough pages to do this. I'm like, oh wait, I've forgotten how to write completely and I'm a fraud. And uh, and then like by the middle of it, I'm just at my absolute lowest point. And the middle of it where I'm like 11 pages into a 22 page issue and like it sucks. Everything I've written has sucked and I just, I want to be dead. And uh, my wife is always like, how many times you've done this literally hundreds of times and it always ends up the same that usually around that low point, I start seeing art from the artist. And I'm like, oh, this, this isn't so bad from the previous issue. I'm like, oh, the art makes it all better. You know, it's going to be OK. And I sort of like start crawling my way out of, you know, and then by the end, I'm sort of back to where I started. Like the art isn't done, but it's, you know, it has to be abandoned because the, the deadlines are going. But no, I, I just uh, it is I'm so self-critical and uh it's uh, it's hard and so self-doubting. So I do need artists who are confident and stable and professional and just know like, it's gonna be okay, cry baby. I saw a life coach one time talk to a room of artists and explain the cycle that you just described, but rather than a roller coaster, they described it as a circle. 
and you know eventually you sort of get back to that starting point uh you know whenever you're done with the the thing you maybe feel a sense of accomplishment but it, it it felt like uh at least my recollection is it felt like that room breathed a sigh of relief of just having this be explained in a way that like this is pretty typical for a creative process that you have an idea and that's you know you're high on that idea and it's enough momentum to start this process and of course the doing it how do you do it and sometimes you know now you're tired and hungry and you know but eventually if you finish it comes back and most people don't make it all the way around that circle because it's so unpleasant and it's like I'm not good. And usually, yes, you know, people have pointed out that your taste level matures before your skill. So you know what's good and what's not. And it's so frustrating when you can't produce what seems to be good. And I just wish that would end now having done this for 20 something years. Like, can I just be cool with it and just be normal and be like, all right, it's going to be a little tough going at the beginning, but it'll be fine. But I'm just such a mess. Just having this conversation, I just know that it's a big help to to people who are out there, man, uh, to just identify this, to feel a little bit less lonely. I mean, Jimmy, I've, like you, you've helped me before where like I described this feeling that I had whenever I would put out a new book when it should be a very like fun, nice time like in my life. Like I wouldn't be able to get out of bed and it was it was increasingly longer and longer times like a week like i got up to a month where i wouldn't talk to anybody and just not look online or anything like that not not deal with anything and you were like oh that's um oh shit what the hell is imposter syndrome. yeah 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 that, that, that's imposter syndrome man like obama had it the first day he was in the oval office all by himself and, and i'm like just being able to put an association to it put it put a tag on it a definition relieved all of that stress completely uh, so just having that conversation, Brian, is is a very valuable thing. Like, hopefully, you get you get the relief you need to still keep operating at the same high level and everything. But I'm pr- I promise you, people out there are uh, really, really taking this to heart in a positive way. Good, that's nice to hear. Because yeah, I I always thought like when I'd hear it, people be like, I love writing. I I did feel like a fraud, like because I I don't, and uh, it does not come naturally. And I guess don't worry. Uh, you know, if you're out there and it doesn't, it what, does for almost none of us. What, uh, you know, like, 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 like what you're describing right now of, of not enjoying it, like what propels you to keep doing it? Uh, yeah, I mean, there is like a Catholic, a capital C Catholic guilt. It, it helps a lot. Like that's where it is. I couldn't be a novelist because I think I would just quit. But knowing that there is an artist and there is a letterer and they're waiting for pages is I love it because if it weren't for that deadline pressure and we're knowing there's another human being counting on you to do this, I really need that to push me forward. So guilt and shame is what gets you to finish it. And then, I mean, when the, I, I, I don't want to sound like a total masochist because then the, the comic comes out and I, it is such joy and a relief and I'm so proud of, you know, particularly the, the art getting to see it. I do, I love the finished product. So that's, but I wish I could say that was enough. Just love of the game was enough for me to push through. But it is knowing there are other people counting on you. Do you think that some of this, like Brian, you as a Clevelander and we're a couple of Pittsburgh boys, but like Rust, Rust Belt community people, uh-huh. do you think that some of this neurosis comes, from, and I'm speaking for myself as much as the things that you, you've laid out, do you think that it come that there's a little bit of a regional component to you, like to, to to that mentality? Everybody around you is maybe paycheck to paycheck for for a long time, and you get to sit around in your flip flops and hide your Star Wars jammies underneath the Zoom <laughs> uh, screen when, when we're sitting here chilling on a on a Thursday afternoon. Like, does 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 that factor into this idea of like being so hard on yourself? You think? Well, I don't know, but but that that work ethic, or I guess what we used to call work ethic, and I read kids online call internalized capitalism, uh, <laughs> is there, and uh, I get this need of like, uh, you know, uh, were you productive today? Did not? Did you have a good day? Did you have a productive day? Like, and yeah, coming from a, a steel town, and like I had my sort of grandfather's plaque from the uh, Timken Company where I worked uh, forever, you know, and is there? They're always. Yeah, a family of hardworking, productive people. And it does feel like, all right, if you're going to be one of these art miscreants who goes out to, you know, be an artist instead of working, mind you, at least have a responsibility to still keep producing. 
So yeah, I'm, I'm sure there that has uh, a lot of it. I wonder if the other part comes from competition. You know, you must have seen going through film school and then you know getting into like like working at Marvel. You must have seen a ton of just how competitive creative writing is. I was so uh, competitive early on, and I was really miserable early on, and it just felt like trying to get jobs at Marvel and DC is just where there were you know so many rats fighting over these few pieces of cheese. And it was like, I was such a nobody and it was hard to get work. And I did have a lot of disdain for like, why did this person get this book? And I just remember there's a scene in Eddie Campbell's Alec where uh, he's talking about writing and he's he's like our creation, I think. And he's like, there are two kinds of creators. There's like one uh, um, and you see someone who's sort of broken into the castle and there's the creator who's like, what is that idiot doing in the castle? Like, how do you get up there? He doesn't deserve to be up there. And then there's the creator who feels a great calmness seeing that person is like, oh, that person got in. It's only a matter of time until I get in. Everything's going to be okay. And I just, I literally remember reading that page and being like, uh, it just immediately unlocks something. And like, this isn't a competition with other writers. This is a competition with yourself and uh, just be cool and keep working at it, but do not worry about other people or their success or failures. And I like to think I really haven't been competitive with other than Ed Brubaker, uh, you know, <laughs> anyone since. And, and, and how does that work? Did you guys like both like sort of enter the, the mainstream scene, Marvel DC scene, like around the same time? And he, and he was just he was just always there because that's usually how it works. You know, you <laughs> see the same fucking face and it's not a real nemesis. It's, you know, it's iron sharpens iron typically, I mean, unless, yeah, unless you dispel always- that. Uh, he was around and then, but it was literally, we were, uh, I guess this is the late nineties, early aughts, I guess, but we were both up for a Batman job and the editor was like, I'll let you both write a couple of issues and then I'll decide who gets to keep writing Batman. And, uh, I wrote a couple issues and Ed wrote a couple issues and they're like, Oh, we're, we're definitely going to Ed. And I was like, well, fuck it. Like I, I'm done at this point. I would like, I think Swamp Thing had already like uh, had been canceled at that point. I did a bunch of other shit that didn't go over well. And I was like, I- I'm done. Like all I have, I got this idea about a guy in a world of women with a monkey and it's idiotic, but like, this is all I have. So like, I'll pitch this Why the Last Man to Vertigo because I lost that on Batman to Brubaker. But when this doesn't go, I'm just going to go try and make a living in television or something. So I'm very grateful to Ed ultimately that he got that gig. <laughs> I know a, a lot of people like like your comics are responsible for for creating and sustaining a certain kind of comic readership. There are people who read your comics, be it either Why the Last Man or Saga, and and like and that's it. That's the comics that they read, man. And and it's it's pretty cool. Like where, wherever I I used to the cafe, I used to um write the X Men Grand Design stuff every day. I would go there. The barista lady, her son's name was Yorick, and and I'm like Shakespeare, but like Yorick is the skull. Like why would you name your, your son after the skull, she's like, no, why the last man? It's pretty cool. I heard a fun, I fun story about a kid named after Yorick. Brian, really? do you want to – you? I heard it from you on an interview. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. I, okay, I I'll give fill it, it in. You met, me. you met some parents who named their son after Yorick, and uh, right. he was quick to tell you that it, his schoolmates called him urine. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you remember that. Yeah. yeah. Whoops. Sorry I ruined your life, son, but uh, <laughs> what are you going to do? Brian, do you read stuff that would surprise us, like um, comic strips you, you referenced earlier, Terry and the Pirates? Do you read manga? Do you read web web comics? Any, any Anything yeah, like I, that? I mean, my son's got me into web comics more. He's 12 now, so uh, yeah, so I, I've tried to dip a toe uh, into that world, but yeah, well, here's on my pile. I'm reading... This uh, man in furs now from our friends at Fantagraphics. It's hot. Heard of it him. is uh, the writers. It's Catherine Sovat and Anne Simon. And just about this dude that masochism is named after. So if you're into dirty, filthy stuff, I thought that was incredible. So that's just on my nightstand uh, now. But yeah, I do. I, I try to read a little bit of everything. Does that extend to novels? Like uh, so many, you know, once again, Steve Steve King uh, on writing is like you got to read, and and he's a guy. He's given 
fucking 10,000 pull quotes to people so that suggests he's walking around with a paper back and just like reading while he's heating up his macaroni and cheese <laughs> I think that's how his life goes I think so man uh, does that factor into uh, to, to your yeah. day? Yeah but I'd be lying if I, I said I read as many novels as I did comics that I, I'm just goofy about comics and so yeah I've got a big stack on my nightstand but they're way more half read novels Whereas comics, I just I don't get tired of. And do, I'm like, do you keep sorry? do you keep uh, like long boxes and stuff? Do you no, got a big I, comic room, of some kind of man cave, man? This is very classy. Yeah. You know, we, it's very rare that we see a marble fireplace and things, man. Usually, we I'm, see everybody's really obnoxious. This is only because I get good Wi-Fi up here. This is our uh, main uh, bedroom that I'm in. This is not my palatial office. Mar- but, Mark so, Miller showed but, off his palatial yeah. estate as well, man. I, I dig the long boxes. I do have an insane number of long boxes down in the garage. Cause I used to, when I was working in DC, they send you everything. When you reach a certain level, their comps, everything they publish every month. And it's been such like a white elephant because part of it was like, I'll, you know, maybe I'll give these out at Halloween to kids. But like if one errant preacher ends up in someone's <laughs> Halloween bag, like that's, there'll be pitchforks outside for me. And, uh, so they've just been in there for decades. And my wife is like, you know, there, there must be rats living like deep inside of these long boxes they've nested into. So I should probably do something with those someday. But uh, no, I just have uh, you know, just stacks and stacks and piles that I try to slowly work my way through. You, mm-hmm. you were part of a like a Marvel writing apprentice program. Is, is that right? Yeah, kind of. It's, it's weird to have this, uh, you know, an hour into our conversation. But uh, I, I did come across that and was curious about it. Could you tell us a little bit about what that was and, sure. and how beneficial or not beneficial it was? Oh, man, it, it was nuts. So this was like uh, halfway through film school and I'm burnt out and I'm like, should I go be an FBI agent or something other than this? Because this isn't working. And I just read good old Wizard magazine uh, was describing that there was something called the Stanhattan Project or like the Manhattan Project, but named after Stan Lee. Of course. His Marvel editors were, uh, you know, the training writers at some college. And I was like, God damn, how come that can't be me? And I kept reading. I was like, it is me. It's NYU. It's just happening right now. And they're like a guy named Joe Kelly. And I was like, Joe Kelly, that grad student who wheels TVs into our classroom, like he's writing for Marvel now. And uh, yeah, so I, I was the second year of the Stanhattan Project. And uh, is this idea of a then Marvel editor named James Felder, who everyone called the professor. And he was just a really smart, thoughtful guy who realized like late 90s Marvel was in trouble. And it was sort of like a lot of their writers were former editors who were former assistant editors. And it was like, it had become really incestuous. And he was like, we've got, you know, NYU down the street. They're classically trained young writers who not only would probably work for us, but probably work incredibly cheap. So let's just go over there and, you know, give them some ins and outs and we'll see if, you know, they're any worth recruiting. And I think at the time NYU is like, we're not gonna, if parents find out we're teaching comic books at New York University, you know, they'll uh, pull their children out of school. So it wasn't an official class. We had to meet in secret at night and just like an unused room. And there were just a couple of us and James Felder and another Marvel editor, Mark Powers, would like, they just bring like, okay, here are a couple photocopied uh, pages of a new Silver Surfer issue. Let's say that you just got this, dialogue this for us. Like, here's the one page plot the artist was given. Just lay some captions and dialogue over this and let's see how it goes. And I just, I loved it right away. And I just, I learned so much. And uh, yeah, so from there, James is like, you know, threw me a small gig. I think I got a $5 a page page rate, tryout rate at Marvel to uh, write some stuff in the late 90s. And uh, yeah, I was still a teenager. I was still uh, 19 having, uh, they would just call me and they'd be like, here's a Wolverine issue that's hilariously behind. Can you just dialogue it today and just run it over? And I, I couldn't afford to fax the pages over of my balloon placements. So I would just write it and then I would just literally run down the street to the Marvel offices to hand deliver some terrible Wolverine dialogue for them to publish. And so, you know, it took a long time though from those like first early courtesy gigs that they threw me 
to sort of work my way up to like a solo credit and then, you know, eventual books for them. But it was such a great class. And I'm so indebted to James Felder forever for being there. That's so cool. I would have been very upset to not have that on the record, man. I do love those stories. Yes. That, that, it's kind of an amazing, uh, I don't know about origin exactly, but that that's a, it's, it's great to hear those stories because yeah. like everybody does this differently. And uh, you do kind of like just take the opportunity that's in front of you and hopefully make the most of it. But you know, you know something. Yeah, my, my friend Devin Grayson breaking in always described it as like, yeah, as comics is a fortress, and if you get in, they immediately plug up that hole behind you. They're like, no right. one else is getting in this way. So if you're like Gail Simone, and like you get attention by writing, a, you know, a humor column for comic book resources, like no one else gets to do it that way. Like you've got to find your own path, and it is it's hard because it's not like if you want to become a dentist know exactly how many years of dentistry school you know where to apprentice but comics is like there is no one path to get into this so you really have like 90 percent of your creativity is finding like how to get gigs and then 10 percent is the actual creation of it when you get there but it's a it's a weird little industry one of the fun things about uh going to conventions and and uh hanging out with people who write comics and digging in the crates to like look for stuff is to just see there is a difference to the way comic writers often uh, like scan the comic. Like I see a lot of this, <laughs> a lot of this man scanning the dialogue and shit. Brian, I wonder before we get out of here, man. Uh, you mentioned uh, whenever we were corresponding to set this up that, that you have a lot to say about Paul Chadwick's Concrete, and that oh, was man. after that was after we posted some of our probably like Brian Leo Malley videos where we had the top down view had had a homie uh-huh. with us. Would you come on? Uh, at a future time and, and, and break down an issue or two of, uh, of something with us. And, and I'd break down the whole concrete series if yeah. you want to. I, oh yeah. That sounds awesome. I love that. That book is so important to me and yeah, really life changing. And it was funnier when I met Garth Ennis that he also mentioned how much he loved concrete and I would not have guessed Garth as a concrete fan, but I think both of us just lasered in and to how unique that vision was and balancing mundane reality with like imaginative fantasy and just like really a writer with something to say just i just i love that book i feel like that's a book that uh people don't talk about now i i i have had two very brief conversations about concrete maybe in the last 20 years and yet at one point it was like the indie darling black and white kind of comic and it's just fallen out of I don't know, conversation in comics it's for inter- some reason. It's interesting, too, because it would be a generation of head of you guys, you and Brian, that, that were really the people bolstering it the most. You know, So you're, you're a little bit of an exception, Brian. Uh, you would have been very young. Break. I remember reading yeah, like a comics journal article with Chadwick, and it sounded great. And I was like, oh, this is a blind spot in my comics upbringing. But I think maybe that's why it's hard to like – where do you begin like which concrete volume one and like there's sort of his origin story but you start there or so yeah i think dark horse is probably just like one set of new additions of putting it out for this to be back on everyone's radar because it it is it's such important comics i love it so you know between jim and i we have a lot of it but we would want to make sure that we have the the quintessential one that we have to fuck with with you so like so like what would that be what uh, mini series or whatever man i gotta make a note because uh, <laughs> you know, know you're coming back right yeah you you could uh you could pick anyone but his uh, uh there's that uh sort of undersea adventure where uh, he might drown which is like incredible storytelling his mountain summit is great but i just i'd forgotten you guys were going through and showing that first short story of the birthday party <laughs> I forgot. That's incredible. I like it's such an amazing way to start the story and a character, and it's funny and dramatic. I love it. So I I, I can't give you the greatest hits. Just pick one. Cool. <laughs> cool. We'll talk offline, man. Jimmy, are you good? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, thanks so much, Brian. This has been fantastic. Really great to catch up. Guys, it's a real pleasure. I've been watching Kayfabe since the first episode. I got to say, it's so wild. I knew you both from WYSIWYG was the first thing that I read of Ed's. And then Street Angel, obviously, I've loved forever. But when I started watching, I was like, 
Well, let's see. The WYSIWYG guy must be sort of the shy, quiet, nice nerd. It's the computer <laughs> one. And the street angel guy has got to be this ruffian over here. And <laughs> so what are you saying? <laughs> confound expectations. That, uh, uh, you flipped it on me. Every now and then, man, like uh, homies will, will send us uh, photos at signings and things, man. And you, you're rocking the kayfabe gear. So, like, uh, you, you, you're not playing around, dude. It's it's really cool. Jimmy and I have to compare notes and try to figure out which concrete story we got to unpack, <laughs> man. But we got to have you back. We got to do this again before we get out of here. You mentioned the Substack. Uh, what what other things do we do? We got to plug. Uh, put links in the description below. Your Instagram. Oh, that's and nice. Uh, no, I mean uh, Saga and uh, Spectators over at Exploding Giraffe, and uh, and that's it. I got some other sort of stuff in the the early stages, but um, that's it. And uh, I hope people dig it. Fantastic, Brian! Thank you so much for coming by. Uh, okay, the audience best. appreciates it. They've been they've been uh, requesting your presence, and you know I asked you like a year ago. It's very kind. I hope uh, my stories were not too boring. I'll bring more dirt next time. Steve Scrooge was like, "You can't be boring on there, Vaughn. You got to throw shade <laughs> at some creators. Get on there." And I don't have it in me. I'm sorry. 